Man, Colossians has been a great study. I have thoroughly loved Colossians. You know what? As a matter of fact, I grabbed my today's New International Version, which just happened to be the closest Bible I had at hand, because I wanted to get a running start into my message in Colossians chapter 4, and I wanted to just refresh my memory about the headings, even those headings that the translators, not inspired, but those section headings the translators gave to all the places we've been already, even that stuff's preachable. I just started getting a running start, and here's what it said, the supremacy of the Son of God. Paul's labor for the church. Spiritual fullness in Christ. Freedom from human rules. Amen. <laughs> Made alive in Christ. Instructions for Christian oikos households. Mark Moore preached on so well. And I was so excited to see my section heading. Here it is. Further instructions. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what, did it get to be 5 p.m. in that translation committee meeting? And they said, boys, we've got a little bit left. But what do you say? Further instructions, I'll take care of the rest of it. <laughs> it's almost like that stuff at the end of a great service where the preacher stands up at the end and people have already been held too long, but it's been good stuff. And he finally says, is there anything else that, anybody, that we got left, we left out? Anybody, anything anybody needs to say? I'm surprised Nick Pollard recognized this, I think accurately, as the most straightforward teaching about evangelism in all the scripture. I'd suggest Nick Pollard thinks it's a little more important than the today's New International Version translators thought when they entitled it Further Instructions. And apparently the folks who planned our Colossians series found something important in it because they reminded us that it tells us how to speak for Christ. Now I've amended that just a bit. I'm going to change it to how to make a difference for Christ because while it does address our lip, it also talks, first of all, about our life. Now, maybe the reason some people miss the significance of chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, is because it's so elementary sounding. It's pretty basic stuff. Now, Paul has his deep stuff. In fact, Paul can get so deep that Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 wrote, Man, that guy can write some stuff that's hard to understand. Remember that? That guy's hard to understand, but this isn't one of those passages. In fact, when I read my assigned passage, I thought about a little girl. I may have told you about her before. Her name was Sierra. She was a little toddler in my racing church when I had a preaching ministry. Sierra was home uh, sick one day, and just she and her mom, she crawled up on Kim's lap, and Kim was trying to comfort her and pat her and encourage her. And, and just about that time, the Billy Graham crusade came on TV, and Kim said, Oh, Sierra. And she'd been raised in Sunday school. Oh, Sierra, this is the greatest preacher possibly of all times. You're so lucky. You get to hear the greatest preacher who ever lived. Sierra just pulled forward in her mom's lap. She couldn't wait. Billy preached, and if you know anything at all, if you've seen any of the clips of Billy's sermons, there's nothing, I don't mean not insignificant, or I don't, I don't even mean it's not deep, but Billy makes everything perfectly understandable. And at some point, Billy Graham is going to make a beeline to the love of God as demonstrated on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what he did. He leaned into the television camera and he said, Stadium audience and television audience, if you don't get anything else from what I'm saying tonight, don't miss this. God loves you. He really does. At which point, Sierra looked at her mom and went, Duh! And crawled off her lap and went to play. <laughs> Billy had completely underwhelmed Sierra. <laughs> what does verses 2 through 6 say in Colossians 4? How's he going to close out? Here are his two thoughts. Pray for missionaries and live right. <laughs> Pray for missionaries and live right. I love it. It really is like something you'd throw in as everybody's leaving to head to the potluck dinner. Hey, remember, pray for our missionaries and live right out there. And yet I think Nick Pollard is right. It is the most significant, straightforward teaching about evangelism in all the New Testament. Here it is. I'll read it for you, and then we'll dive in. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. 
Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. English Standard Version. Folks, here it is. Here's how you and I can make a difference. Particularly, here's how you and I can make a difference if we don't feel particularly wired or gifted for evangelism. You ever feel a little insignificant and unqualified when people refer to you as an evangelist? Well, here's how you and I can make a difference. Paul, the apostle, says, pray for us. Pray for me. It's why I'm in chains. I want to pray for opportunities and pray that I may proclaim it clearly. So really, it's not unusual for Paul to ask help from his churches and even people he had never met. But here are two things he says his team needs if they're going to be successful as evangelists. Need number one is opportunity. You pray that I get an opportunity, an open door to speak. Paul is under house arrest in Rome, you remember, and he needs more and other and more public opportunities to speak. I love this. Paul thinks that from miles distant, the Colossians can make a difference and get some opportunities for him to preach. He thinks they can influence his ministry wherever he is, even under house arrest. And so you pray for open doors. Now, I could talk about this for a while, but it is so elementary. And so I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do instead is let you experience the most authentic hearing of the Word of God you'll get to do. I, 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 occasionally, we teach a seminar called how to, how to Read the Bible in Public. I get all this further instruction type of stuff, extra stuff. Think about this. The most authentic hearing you ever have of the Word of God is to hear it read to you. That's the way the early believers experienced it. Now, you get in your mind, because I'm going to pray for us all, some evangelist. I mean somebody gifted, wired, and called by God, or who has chosen to cross cultural lines and national boundaries to stand up for the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you get somebody in mind. I'm not going to give you examples. You know somebody who represents the kingdom of Jesus well someplace. It may be your home church staff. It may be somebody on foreign soil. It may be somebody here in Joplin, Missouri. It may be somebody on campus, but somebody you know who is particularly gifted by God to stand up and proclaim the gospel. I want you to get them in mind. And now I want you to bow your head because I think we can influence ministries distance. Bow your heads, and you think about those individuals you have in mind. God, I thank you for evangelists. I thank you for missionaries. I thank you for so many people represented in the minds and hearts of our body gathered here this morning who are standing up for Jesus no matter where they are. And God, at this very moment, would you open a door an opportunity for them to stand up and proclaim that gospel. Would you let us have an impact in their ministries in that way? We love you, we care about you, and Jesus is alive, and we believe it. Give them an open door. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here it is. Pray for evangelists. Pray for opportunities. Here's the second thing Paul says they need. Not only do they need opportunity, but he wants clarity. I love that on the part of a communicator. Would you pray that when I open my mouth, I may proclaim it clearly? And I love what Paul adds, as I ought to. Clarity is the ought to in communication, along with boldness. It's how he ought to speak. Now, there were times he said, please pray for boldness. For example, Ephesians chapter 6. Pray for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. But here he doesn't have his mind on boldness. Here he has his mind on clarity. Would you pray that when I talk about the mystery of Jesus Christ, I can make it clear to people. I want to make it apparent. I want to make it obvious. I want it to be impossible to misunderstand. I love a grade school essay on pigs that Rick Warren ran across and wrote about in one of his articles. Here's what he says, quote, Pigs. A pig is a funny animal, but it has some uses. Our dog doesn't like pigs. Our dog's name is Nero. My teacher read a piece one day about a wicked man named Nero. My daddy's a good man. Men are very useful. Men are different from women, though, and my mom ain't like my daddy. My mom says that a ring around the sun means a storm's coming, and that's all I know about pigs. <laughs> hey, I've heard those sermons before. 
what? <laughs> I don't think Paul's worry here is lack of organization, however. It's not organization he seems to have in mind. Paul knew that after all, artistry and philosophy and exalted speech could get in the way of making the mystery plainly known. I love what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come. I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God, but not with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Paul knew that philosophy and artistry and sophistry could get in the way of anyone hearing clearly the mystery. And he said, you pray not just for opportunities, but you pray when I stand up to speak, I may declare it clearly the way I ought to declare it. He seems to be more concerned about the fact that it's mystery. It's the mystery he's proclaiming. Something that, as a matter of fact, had to be revealed to him to even be understood. Mystery. You know what a mystery is. It's something that at one time was unclear and unknown. But now, through revelation, it's known. It almost sounds like the kind of stuff you might have to appear on a road to somebody and blind them over and then get their attention and explain, guess what, Gentiles are included in God's love. You're the man to tell them that. It almost sounds like the kind of stuff you might have to send an angel to shepherds on a, on a hillside to declare good news of great joy for all people. It almost sounds like the kind of stuff you might have to appear on a rooftop to, in a vision, to an apostle, no less, to say, don't you ever call dirty and contaminated again what God has cleansed. God is willing to cleanse all people, and aren't you glad? All people. And Paul said, when I stand and proclaim it, I want to do it clearly. You get the point, don't you? It is shocking information, and few of God's people saw it coming when the incarnation took place. And he dwelt among us, shocking God's people with most of what he said, much of what he did, and almost always with whom he associated. God in the flesh was shocking, and he loves all people. Clarity is important because it deals with how the world becomes aware that they're included in God's love. Paul wanted it to be clear. I seem to always be pointing out in my classes particular dangers that I think exist on the campus of Ozark Christian College. You understand, don't you, I love being here. You understand I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But when you're in a place that gives its time and its attention to training people who are going to be out there representing King Jesus, I'm just suggesting that it's important to know what particular temptations exist on our campus. Maybe this is why they don't, lead, they don't let me have much to do with Tuesday tours. By the way, if you come here, here's a half dozen ways God might, uh, oh, God. <laughs> here's a half dozen ways God will try to get you. Here's about a half dozen ways Satan will attack you if you come here. It's also maybe why I'm not asked to speak to Key Russo. It used to be God's spokesman years ago. God's spokesman was the preacher club that met on campus. And I was asked to speak one time, and the question came up, what's the preaching, I was a preaching minister at the time, what's preaching ministry like for you? Just a sincere preaching student asked me, and I said, well, for me, it's weekly diarrhea. <laughs> Anybody here who knows me well enough to know anything about my nervous disposition is not surprised. <laughs> it was a love-hate relationship, and the hate side pervert, uh, pervert, uh, perverted, perverted. <laughs> I'm not even going to finish the line, and it was good.
Here's the danger, preachers. Here's the danger, proclaimers. Here's the danger, students of homiletics. Do not become so enamored with the art of sermon preparation and delivery that your message is overpowered and muddied up by your ability. When we walk away saying, my goodness, how he labors over every phrase, we might just have missed something. Now you study it in class, you dissect it, you pick it apart because we want you to know how to handle it when you get out of here. But when you stand up to speak and leading up to the time you get up to speak, would you at least spend as much time trying to understand it and communicate it clearly as you do trying to use all your talent and come off looking good? Would you do that? Paul said you pray for opportunities, and while you're at it, you pray that when I stand up and speak, it would be with clarity. I loved it when Mark Moore last week went to meddling. That's what my grandma always called good preaching. <laughs> uh, once it became so clear that you couldn't misunderstand or do an end run around the application, my grandma said, woo, he went to meddling. That means he got real with our lives. It's not that we didn't understand last week. It's that it was ringingly clear what the authority of God is in our lives. Well, here's what you can do. I don't care whether you're wired and gifted and called by God for evangelism or not. Here's what you can do. You can pray for evangelists. I'll promise you two things. You pray for opportunities, and they'll get some doors to speak through. And you pray for clarity so that when they stand up and speak the mystery of Christ, the world does not misunderstand. We are included in God's plan. But here's the second way you can make a significant difference to the kingdom of God. Not just pray for evangelists, but watch for your own opportunities. Oh, it may not, may not be public. It may not be quite as bold. It may not be quite as frequent. But with your life and your lip, you're going to get opportunities. And so here's what Paul says to the everyday believers. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how, to, how you ought to answer each person. Paul says there are a couple of areas you and I ought to give our attention to in our lives, and area number one is my behavior. He simply says, walk wisely toward outsiders. Not everything I do is smart. Wow. About a week ago, our president's secretary sent me an email, and President Proctor had a Oh, a to-do thing on his list that I could help him out with. And so he was just asking through Kathy if, if I would be willing to take care of that for him. And I was more than glad to do that. I wrote Kathy back, though, President Secretary. Here's, here's what I wrote in my email to her. <laughs> he asked me to help. Here's what I wrote back. Will do, Kath. And be sure to say thanks to Matt. And I put it in quotation marks along with the proper drip of sarcasm and facial expression, which I'm sure you can picture on my face right now. <laughs> Griff. I signed it Griff. Within two minutes, I had a response. Dear Griff, I'd be happy to tell him, but it won't be necessary since you just responded to Matt's email. There's more. <laughs> Our sympathetic school secretary wrote, too bad you can't see the facial expression I have right now. <laughs> Wish I could see yours. <laughs> Helpfully yours, Kathy. <laughs> Not wise behavior. <laughs> well, I don't know what my boss currently thinks of me. But Paul was very concerned what outsiders, catch this, please don't miss it. Paul was very concerned what outsiders thought about believers in their daily lives. He was very concerned about how outsiders perceived the church. Professor Moore said last week that living the life was an evangelism issue when he was talking to us about submission. He said it's an evangelism issue, and so it is. And Paul turns his mind to the outsiders. It's not very politically correct. These are non-believers Paul's talking about. He's just outsiders. But he didn't care. He cares about what they think about the church. 
Paul wrote similarly to everyday kinds of believers in Thessalonica. I don't know what it is about me, but I'm always drawn to the everyday kind of believer passages in Scripture. Here's what he wrote to everyday believers in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. To work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul was very concerned that when people saw everyday believers going through life, they had nothing with which to accuse them accurately and legitimately. It's simply right to care what they think and to live the Jesus life toward them in a way that will get attention to our message. I understand why he's concerned about that. Uh, years ago, I was seated in the Seneca football stands for a playoff game against Branson. It was just, man, it was exciting. It was just, I mean, there, you could not even talk to the person next to you. It was so loud. It was just so celebrative and loud. And suddenly, for a split second, there was absolute silence. I don't know why, but I heard a teenage girl about two rows back say, Oh, that's Griff. And, of course, I don't have a chest, but where one would be, I stuck it out. <laughs> I didn't know what she was going to say. Dead silent, she said, oh, that's Griff. He's our preacher, but he's okay. That's what she's, but he's okay. <laughs> hey, unfortunately, I know what she meant, don't you? Because Christianity, and I use Christianity in quotation marks as well, because Christianity has made some people anything but okay. It has made them harsh and judgmental and putting themselves up on a perch. I love what Robert Burns said in his book, The Examined Life, quote, When we evangelize from the top of a hill, we shouldn't be surprised if most of what we say goes over the head of the many, end quote. Lewis Sperry Schaefer says, and he that is spiritual, spirituality hinders sin. He's, he's commenting on the life of Jesus, by the way, his holiness. Spirituality hinders sin, but should never hinder the friendship and confidence of sinners. If our kind of spirituality makes Christ unattractive to others, it needs some drastic changes. True spirituality is an inward adorning. It is most simple and natural and should be a delight and an attraction to all. And may I suggest to you that in the gospel records, wherever Jesus went and touched and changed and left lives better off than he found them, people showed up. They wanted to be near him. Well, Paul says you watch... You watch your walk, watch your daily life. Live smart in a way that will get attention to the second thing he talks about, which is your lips, your words. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. By the way, that's very similar to what Peter writes. I think Peter's writing to a formal trial kind of situation, maybe where you're actually being interrogated about faith. Peter wrote, In your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's the proper way to speak to the outsider, with gentleness and respect. I wrote in the margin of my Bible at 1 Peter 3.15, respectful evangelism, respectful evangelism. Well, Peter may be writing to a trial situation or an interrogation situation. Paul is not. Paul is writing to everyday kinds of believers in everyday life, and he says, let your conversation always be with salt. That is seasoned and gracious. Let it be gracious talk as you respond to them. Folks, I'm not at all certain you and I live in a grace talk kind of time. Electronic communication has increased both our boldness, that's a good thing, and our rudeness. And that's a bad thing. Truth may sometimes offend, but when it does, may it be the truth that offends. Jesus did say some would choose to disbelieve and remain under the wrath of God. But may it never be because you and I did not do what we could to have gracious, salted speech. Proverbs 16, 21 says, Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. wonder if there are any outsiders... I ought to apologize to for either my life or my words.
Now, why do further instructions matter? Because what Paul and the everyday Colossi believers are trying to communicate is what he calls mystery. What a great mystery the apostle and prophets of the New Testament church have let us in on. I'm going to read just shotgun style some quick passages that relate to mystery. Paul says at the chapter 1 of Colossians, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that God gave me. So God gave Paul something. Here's why. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, here it is, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, Colossians, Christ in you, Gentiles, so Christ in you, Ozark Christian College, the hope of glory. The mystery is that the Jewish Messiah who overcame death is now Lord of all. Ephesians 1 talks about the mystery, verse 9 and 10. He wants to make known the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set for in Christ. Here it is, to unite all things in him. Ephesians 3 talks about the mystery. I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that's given to me, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I've written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. God loves everybody. Romans 16, 26. The revelation of the mystery was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations. Even Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when he quotes that great creed of faith, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godly, the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, catch this, proclaimed among the nations. Oh, it was rather unclear. It was there in the Old Testament, but it was a little cloudy and unclear. But now you and I know that what God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, that that has come true in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, who is now Christ among you the hope of glory I don't even care this morning if when I'm done you look at one another say duh climb out of your seats and go on about your daily business as long as your daily business is praying for those people on the front lines telling the world God loves them and as long as your daily business includes you living out there for Jesus who is Lord of all bow your heads Father again clarity for the proclaimers open doors for our lives we sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Live wise toward those on the outside and speak with grace whenever we get a chance. Would you just open our mouth?